here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it's talking about the building of the church of Jesus Christ. And it's specifically talking to the elders or the leadership of the church of Corinth. He has some real powerful words to speak that apply to us here in this time of history. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is all about the building of the church in the city of Corinth. And again, it's applied to the building of the church in our city. Now, one fundamental conviction I've held for many years, for 20 plus years, is that it is the purpose of God, it is the revelation of the scripture, that there is one church from a heavenly standpoint in every city or every geographic location. There may be a thousand expressions of that church, a thousand congregations, but from the heavenly point of view, the way that the angels see it, they see one body of Christ, one church in every geographic area. And the purpose of God is to bring the leadership of that church into unity with God's mind and therefore into unity with one another. Now, sometimes we've sought to pursue a unity with one another that's separated from unity with the vision and the mind of God. It ends up becoming a form of humanism which is very fragile. It never holds up under pressure. We can have all the gatherings, and I'm not really against them at all. I'm for any time when God's leaders come together to talk about how they can consciously work together. But any gathering together that's not built upon a revelation of the heart of God and the purpose of God and individual leaders committed to that revelation and that purpose if we skip that step and try to build unity this way instead of our unity being our agreement with one heart and one purpose that dwells in the heart of God, we can have a unity horizontally, but it ends up becoming fragile. It becomes superficial and it always breaks when pressure comes. I'm interested in unity and any kind of unity, meaning that any time there's a movement of unity in the heart of God's leaders, men and women across the city, in governmental leadership, I rejoice even if it's a little baby step. That's good. We don't need the full release before we begin to rejoice. We rejoice in every level going forward. But I know this. We'll only have genuine deep unity to the degree that the governmental ministries of any city, I'll talk about this city, it's the same of every city, so my positives or negatives are not unique to this city. They can be said of any city but we'll only have a unity that is substantial in as much as the governmental leaders of this city seek. I mean seek with diligence the revelation of God's heart and God's purpose and then abandon themselves to that purpose. Without that, the unity will break. Even though it might appear to exist for a season, my prayer for this city is for red hot men and women of God at the heart level, that don't concern themselves with the dream they've had all these years, that they've waited for, and now the time for their dream, that's an unfortunate mindset that some have. I've had this dream all these years. So what? The only dream that's going to defeat the power of darkness in this city, or any city, is the dream that's born in God's heart. The dream of the Holy Spirit in the present tense he's committed to. So I want to be with spiritual men and women. I don't mean just in our context here. Certainly I want that. But in connectedness, in a lively, fresh love across the city. And that's what I'm asking the Lord to cause those men and women to emerge in this hour. I don't care if they're 17 years old or 77 years old. I don't care what age, if they're male or female. I want the God-called governmental ministries to begin to emerge, to begin to become evident so they can find one another and that their fellowship would be around what's burning in God's heart. Not the sentimental dream they've had ever since they were in seminary because they heard someone else's story and always wanted one of those. That kind of thing... I hear that here and there, and I think, bless you because you're a brother, and I want to be kind, but at the end of the day, it's going to get in the way of the purpose of God in any city. The Lord spoke to me in September 1982. I've shared the word a number of times. 
I will give it in just the briefest form. He spoke to me in Cairo, Egypt. He said one night in a very, very powerful way. He said, I am going to change the understanding and expression of Christianity in the earth in one generation. He said that in a way that shook me to the core of my being. I was wide awake. The word of the Lord came with a clarity I have never, ever had surpassed. The fear of the Lord fell upon me in an actual experience. It is the only time I have had the experience awake where the very fear of the Lord rested on me in a level like that. I have a spirit of fear of the Lord. But I have never had an experience in the fear of the Lord like that on that day in September 1982. The Lord says, I am going to change the understanding and expression of Christianity in the whole earth in one generation. That was the sentence that he spoke, and I knew it by the Holy Spirit. I did not hear these words, but I knew by the Holy Spirit when he said it, I am going to change the understanding of Christianity. I knew instantly by the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gift of discerning of spirits that I could discern his heart, that he was saying, the way that unbelievers understand the church is going to be very different. Right now, unbelievers look at the church of Jesus Christ and it is nearly irrelevant. They do not take it seriously in most parts of the world. It is beginning to change in some places of the world. When he said, I am going to change the expression, I knew instantly by the Holy Spirit he meant the way that we dwell together as born-again believers. The way that the church of Jesus Christ operates in any given city or any given nation, because the church of Kansas City needs to be in a gracious cooperation with the church of Chicago and the church of Dallas, and the churches in Taipei, and the church of Berlin. There needs to be this intentional family of affection that God is raising up through apostolic ministries that will give the leadership to a worldwide. But there will be all kinds of joints of supply of just people falling in love with one another across the nations. So it is more than the church in our city. God wants an international family of affection globally. Miriam, coming to share what is happening in Taipei, her city, or Taiwan, her nation, is very important that we have people come and they hear hearts and they become friends and they have meals and then the next team comes over and then another team comes over. We want to do this throughout China. We want to do this throughout Europe, South America, and Africa. We want to do it all through North America. They come, they go, and joints of supply, different ones fall in love with each other and they begin to help one another. But this international family of affection is going to be led in the real breakthrough by way of God anointing apostolic ministries in cities and nations and bringing those men and women into a deep connection, a Holy Spirit alliance with one another. God is going to change the understanding and expression of Christianity in the whole earth, and he's going to do it in one generation. It's going to be a sudden work of God. I don't know how to put the time frames. I don't know where the book ends on each side of that generation. I just know he is going to do it, and I know that he is about it even now. Ever since that happened in September 1982, I have been on a very intentional, a very intentional quest, a very specific quest for New Testament Christianity in the fullness of what God has ordained at the end of the age. I want New Testament Christianity, that which was released and birthed by the New Testament apostles, brought to its full expression as God has ordained at the end of the age before the second coming of Christ. So we want to go far beyond what they operated in in the book of Acts. People say, we want to get back to New Testament Christianity. 
in principle we do, but in expression we want tenfold the power and the dynamic and the glory because this is truly the will of God for this to happen. But the wisdom is found in the New Testament church. Ever since the Lord spoke that word in September 1982, I have been consciously pursuing, seeking, what does it look like? What does it look like? Because I know God is going to do something entirely different, something very, very new. In some ways, though we honor our past, we do honor our past. It is very important that we honor our heritage, our past. It is very important that we are grateful for what is happening in the present tense, though we are pressing for something, we are desperate for something far beyond what we have now, but we do not despise today. We are grateful for today. We honor our heritage, but it is very important that we understand that in our heritage, all of us, there lies seeds of I don't know if I would use the word destruction, but seeds of hindrance to what is coming in the future. There are seeds planted in all of us that unless those seeds are discerned and pulled out and cast away, those ideas from our heritage, from our personal histories, will become a stumbling block, a stumbling stone for us entering into the new things ahead. It's not easy to honor what God did with you yesterday and to be thankful and yet to discern the seeds of that which will hinder from yesterday, that will hinder us tomorrow. We have to walk this unusual tension, but it is a very, very necessary tension to walk through. I've known this for 20 plus years, that God wants to bring forth a living expression of one church in this city, as in many cities of the earth, many, many different local expressions, but one church. That is the absolute starting point in my thinking of the Church of Kansas City. Whatever we do, whatever steps, it must, it must be working towards one unified expression of governmental ministries in love with one another, in the overflow of their passion for God, and in their commitment to the vision of God for this city. God is going to do that in Kansas City, and we are going to meet in Arrowhead Stadium many, many times. I do not mean that we will meet in Arrowhead Stadium as the rule. We will meet in Arrowhead Stadium for a week or two or a month or two every night, and then it will, there will be times that we will go for 24 hours a day in Arrowhead Stadium for 30 days at a time, and then that season will lift, and we will go back, and there will be local expressions of the body of Christ all over the city. All over the city, there will be apostolic ministries and prophets as a significant measure of anointing, and evangelists and they will be with the family of God all over the city. Then a year or two or three will go by or whatever. I have no insight of the time of the intervals. The Lord will call us again to the stadium, and the apostolic ministries will be released in power, and prophets will prophesy, and the signs and wonders will go. We will be there for a week or two or a month or two. Then God's hands will lift off. We will go back into all the different areas of the region, and we will build the family of God in a very clear and effective way. That I am sure of. I am sure that there is a new wineskin. God wants to do something very, very new, and God will redeem. There is a redemptive blessing or a redemptive purpose with many of our past and our histories and many denominations and many different tribes and streams in the body of Christ. They will continue to have a redemptive purpose, but only as much as they take that which was good, they discern that which was a hindrance, and they bring that which is of God into the mix, into the new thing, and they spit out that which they inherited that was not born of revelation. I know that history tells us that there will be collisions. There will be resistance. The leadership that exists normally 
And this is politically, spiritually, governments, whatever, militaries. The leadership that exists normally is not very open to radical changes to the group that is emerging under them. God is going to give some of the older ministries. I'm 47 years old. I am one of the older ones, the 50 and older crowd. God is going to give us a chance to be part of that which he is going to be anointing young men and women in their 20s and 30s to take a primary role, and God is going to take all across the city the older men and women who have been serving faithfully through the years, or maybe they have not been and he is giving them a second chance. He is going to give us a chance to stand with the vision that he is going to do with an explosion, a youth revival, and there is going to be young apostles and prophets, and it is crucial that the older ones stand with them and support them without any regard to the great vision we've had all these years. It's really, really important. It will be a dividing line, because the Lord will look at me, and he will look at many in my generation, in my age, and he says, Mike, all that you've waited for, if it was not me, it really is in the way right now. I really would appreciate using you, but I would like you to lay that down. There are things I did not tell you. There are expressions you did not know, and I have given it to others that are younger, and if you are really lost in your abandonment to my heart, this will not be a stumbling stone for you. I want to say this. There is no mock humility in this at all. Of course, it is self-evident to you what I'm going to tell you, but there are many, many things that the Lord has not told me about that is in his heart that is very dear to him for this city. I don't know at all. Many things I don't know, and they will be total surprises to me. And there are things that have been dear to me and some that is born in my own human zeal. And the Lord says, that cannot be brought over. You must let go of that. And there's a lot of surprises that you don't know about if you want to participate. And I really wish you would, my dear son, Mike. I really wish you would. But you have to do what everyone has to do. You have to get down flat. You have to get low before me. And it doesn't matter who I put in my hand, but I tell you this, it is going to be mostly young people at the front, not all, but mostly. The measure of the 50 and older crowd is not that none of them will have a role. Our measure of success will be in strengthening and being cheerleaders and spiritual fathers, whether male or female, operating as fathers to bring this thing forward. And it is going to be very, very different than anything that we see today in the body of Christ. It is going to be very different. I don't really care what it's going to be. I just want it to be. That's what Paul is talking here about in 1 Corinthians 3, 1. 1 Corinthians 3, 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. He's speaking to the church in Corinth, particularly because of their division in the church. And that division is so common as a part of the church across the world today. It has become normal. The divided little groups feel like they have a right to hem in all the people that adhere to their leadership and bind them and restrict them. And that seems normal and godly and biblical to do. That is how broken things are today. The very presence of our separation is in itself a cause of concern to anybody paying attention. And the fact that we are separated, to not be concerned, but to go the other direction and feel that we have a right of ownership over the people and the resources of those that God has brought into our leadership is a very very damaging mindset that is prevalent in the church in our nation. The Lord says, they are not yours. The money is not yours. The people are not yours. And the fact that you are not even concerned that you are separated 
and you are doing your own thing, though it has grown a little bit, you must come to a new place of laying the whole thing down. He's talking to babes here. Here goes verse 3, 1 Corinthians 3, 3. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? He goes, you are acting like mere men. You are acting like people without a revelation of the heart of God. He goes, you are acting like the business community that is not born again. You're carrying on like they do when they don't get what they want. He goes, you're acting like mere men. You are people with the access to the heart of God. You have eternal life. You are the beloved of God's heart. Your whole inheritance is so much greater than your earthly ministry. What are you doing? What are you carrying on like this for? He goes on and he gives the issue of division. Here are his denominations, and I'm not going against denominations. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? I believe that some denominations have been tribes and streams that God has entrusted a message or a purpose to. Almost all denominations were born out of a truth God entrusted to leaders. People gather around that truth. Typically, they overemphasize that truth and they become resistant to other parts of the body of Christ. But the fact that God has gathered his people in tribes is not all bad. Denominations as a concept aren't bad. It's denominationalism. It's the spirit. It's the spirit of denominationalism that you can be in a charismatic, non-denominational church and have a denominational spirit. It means the people belong to us. The resource belongs to us. It's our deal. And who are you messing around with my little niche over here? That is the denominational spirit that Paul is talking about. I believe there is going to be whole denominations. I mean, there's about five million of them in the earth. So this is a pretty safe statement. I believe there are going to be whole denominations where the senior leaders at the top, the Spirit of God will touch them and they will bring their entire network into a new thing. I don't believe we write them off. I don't think that's right. They may not be called to the same thing when it's all over. They will interact in a very different way with the other ministries in their city, but I believe there is going to be whole denominations that lay down all of their structures and throw themselves into the new thing. I don't think most of them will, but there will be some that will do it. Others it will be, a part of them will, and a part of them will not and they will divide right down the middle. Don't think of denominations strictly as mainline denominations. Think of denominations, they are charismatic, non-denominational denominations. Many of us in this room have been a part of groups with the denominational spirit. It's our group that is the most important to God, is the denominational spirit. And the people and the financial resource belong to us and not to the purpose of God in our city. That is the denominational spirit. 1 Corinthians 3, 4. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? They were caught up in a denominational spirit. One group was of Paul's denomination. One group was of Apollos' denomination. It says in chapter 1, Paul says this same verse a couple times. One group was of Peter's denomination, and it was not wrong that they had a special relationship to these different men. What was wrong is their relationship to Paul made them resist the people that were related to Peter and to Apollos. There's nothing wrong with tribes and streams as long as the tribes and streams in the body of Christ are celebrating the other tribes with a sincere vigor in a way that they celebrate their own tribe. If we can celebrate other dimensions of what God is doing in this city with the same intensity that we celebrate ourselves, 
We gladly send our people and our money and invest and support it, then we can still be a spiritual family without a denominational spirit on us. This is not an easy thing to do. It's the very heart of sinful man to cultivate a denominational spirit. And it's more than cultivate it. We build monuments and we build institutions to guard that denominational spirit and all of its traditions. Many, many of the structures of today are like scaffolding on a building. They are temporary structures. And as God builds the building called the Church of Kansas City, the temporary structures, the scaffolding, he's going to bring it down. He is going to give them two options. He goes, you can lay it down and be part of the building I'm building, or I will tear it down and you will be on the other side of a lot of disappointment and a lot of pain and confusion. You don't have to resist me. You can lay it down if you want, or I will tear it down for you. Now, this is a word that's true all over the earth, and it's not a word for those guys out there. I'm much more concerned with these guys in here. I'm not nearly as concerned with old brother Bill down the road, wherever. I am far more concerned with our leadership team laying down as we build a certain thing. The Lord will say, that was good for that decade. It must be laid down. There is a fresh wind. There is a fresh expression. It's going to look different. And if you have been celebrating my purpose in the whole city, if you have truly celebrated it, then it won't hurt you to invest the people and the finances into other settings. If you have only been doing it as lip service and not at the heart level, it will pain you and you will come up with theological reasons to not release the people and the finances. Again, I'm not preaching to them. I'm preaching to us right now. And more particularly, I am preaching to my favorite congregation, me. I'm my favorite congregation. I hear myself say things, sometimes I go, oh Lord, back down a little bit. And then I get all bold and then I keep going and then later I go, oh Lord, I got to really buy into this fully, don't I? 1 Corinthians 3, 4. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Verse 4, denominational spirit. Verse 5. 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 7. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. He says he gives them the logic in verses 5 and 6, and in 7 he goes, that denominational spirit thing is really built on faulty ideas. That is what verse 5 to 7 is about. Verse 5 to 8, actually. 1 Corinthians 3.10 According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. Now he goes on and talks in verse 10 about apostolic leaders. He says, According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder. That's a description of the apostolic ministry, and we believe that God is going to bring forth apostles in this work. I had a heavenly visitation in July 1984 where the Lord showed me a chariot, and I described that to you several times. And in that heavenly visitation, which I had an in-heaven visitation, wide awake with the Lord, it's the only I ever had, the Lord showed me there were going to be a company of apostles, of young apostles coming forth out of this work. And so I believe it is biblical, apart from the heavenly experience, I have no way 
out of the argument when I hear people say, do you think apostles are for today? I've been in groups where it is very unpolitically correct. I think, well, this verse could be turned that way. That verse could be turned this way. The arguments go on and I look up and I go, but Lord, I heard it directly from you. And I say, no, I take my stand. I tell you, you may not know it. You may not believe it. It doesn't matter. It will happen anyway. Apostles are coming forth in this hour of history. That I tell you by the word of the Lord. There's going to be a company of them coming forth from this very missions base. We don't have to try to make it happen. This thing has a life of its own. They will come forth. It doesn't matter. It's a call of God. We can even neglect it a little here and there, and that life will come forth in power and in vigor. Anyway, verse 10, God is raising up apostles, wise master builders. They build the foundations that are anointed in that hour of history. See, what we built yesterday was good for yesterday, but in 10 years, we need to dismantle some of the things that we have built for the next decade because we build with an apostolic anointing is what God wants to happen. He wants an apostolic anointing, which has a present tense reality of the structures God wants in that hour. And that will continually involve dismantling things from 10 years ago, from five years ago. Our goal is not to dismantle things. Our goal is to have the present tense will of God and to go with the heart of God. It's interesting, verse 11 to 15, about the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. It's the passage describing standing before the Lord. What's interesting is this passage is written to apostolic leaders, governmental ministries, who build it a way opposite of how God wants it built, or they refuse to go all of the way with what God is doing in their generation. This passage is not about somebody who watches too many movies or they don't really fast on their fast day. This passage is to governmental ministries in cities. And Paul urges them saying, you are going to stand before God, governmental ministries, and if you don't build the church in your city in the way I am breathing on it in that hour, you will suffer loss as a ministry on the day of reward. You will suffer loss. It's not enough to get the old boys club rooting you on if the heavenly council doesn't believe in what you're doing today. It's easy to get the old boys club rooting you on. And what I mean is that the old gang that's been with you from day one, they all bought in. They all signed the paper. They all have the same certificate, and they are not interested in the present tense reality because it costs them too much, and they will pat you on the back. They'll root you on. Brother, preach it. Preach it. And the Lord says, it's the heavenly council you need to be concerned with, not the people you have gathered all around being in agreement that what you are doing is so awesome. It's easy to get a group of people self-serving who want to all convince each other, the Mutual Admiration Society. I tell you, you're awesome. You tell me, I'm awesome. And so we're reinforced in our delusion and we walk right into the judgment seat of Christ, unprepared for the shock of our lives. I have no interest in doing that. Verse 11, Paul tells them, He's talking, and again, this applies to all Christians, but he's focusing on governmental ministries. He goes, There is no other foundation except for the heart connect with the man Christ Jesus. 
if it does not come from the man Christ Jesus. And the implication, the heart connect with him in the present tense. You are not building right if it does not flow out of your intimacy with that man. It's not a right foundation. You cannot build on biblical ideas without a present heart connect and the ideas bear good fruit. Ideas, right ideas, with a disconnect of intimacy ends up in wrong foundations. Some people have imagined the ideas are sufficient for the foundation to be strong. Wrong. The foundation is built of ideas, yes, but it is also built of a company of people who are in a vital living connect with the man Christ Jesus. There is a present anointing in the company of people in their love connect with God based on those biblical ideals. It's far more important. It is far more than just right ideas. I've seen them break down the New Testament, get all of the verses that mean this, all the verses that mean that, all of the Greek words, map them all out. I've done that. It's kind of fun, actually. But that's not enough to build a right foundation. There is no other foundation but Jesus. What that means is, practically, in our setting, it's not just for me, it's not just for you, but together, together, we have intimate connect. I do, you do, you do, however, I do, you do, he does, you know. We all have an intimate connect, and together in unity with one another, with this connect, that is the foundation we are building in this city. I mean, in our little part of the city. Look what he says, verse 12. One of these leaders are going to build on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, but another group of leaders in the same city, they will build with wood, hay, and straw. 1 Corinthians 3, 12-13. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If any man's work, or if you want to put the word here, if any man's ministry, which he's built upon, if it endures the fire of God, that man, that woman, will receive a reward from the master builder himself, Jesus Christ. But if anyone's work is burned, if anyone's work is burned, I am going to come before the Lord and offer up all of the years of ministry, and the Lord's eyes of fire will gaze upon it, and the Lord's eyes of fire will evaluate it according to His fiery heart. And if it's not like His heart, it will be wood and hay. It will burn by the fire of His eyes, the fire of His gaze. If what I'm building is gold and diamonds and jewels, the fiery gaze flowing from His fiery heart will only remove everything to where the gold and the jewels become evident to everybody on the last day. Beloved, it is absolute folly for us to get into a self-serving circle of mutual admiration. I convince you, you convince me, and the thing is not built upon what is real in God's heart. Absolute folly. I can imagine people have done this 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of ministry, and when they stand before the Lord, can you imagine the hours involved in 50 years of ministry? It's gone. The Lord says, you have some really good ideas, but it's not what I was building in your city in that hour. I told you to lay it down half a dozen times. I visited you powerfully. You refuse to do it. And you claim that all of your co-workers heard God and they refused to do it? The whole thing was wood, hay, and stubble. Look at verse 15. 1 Corinthians 3.15 If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, 
but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. That man, his ministry is burned. He suffers loss, but the man himself is still saved. So the man is born again. He's going to go to heaven and enjoy God, but the labor of all those years is gone. Verse 18. Here is the verse that I really want to get to. 1 Corinthians 3.18 Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. I am really gripped with this verse. I quoted this verse last Sunday night. Let no one deceive himself. Let no one get caught up in the spirit of the old boys club. That's just a word picture that I have because I understand how easy that is to happen. Do not be deceived by getting a bunch of people around you. You're patting each other on the back. You're prophesying to each other about how right what you're doing is. When the Lord is saying, I want it radically different. I want it radically different. He says, if anyone among you seems to be wise, let him become foolish in his own eyes that he could become wise. There it is. Beloved, we are standing at a Kairos time in history. I like how Miriam used that word, which means a prophetic moment. We are at a critical transition time in human history. I mean the economy, the military, the terrorism, the global dimensions, the pressure on the planet in so many ways bears witness to the fact we are in a time of transition. I'll say it differently. A time of travail in the planet and the group of people leading in the hour of travail are the born again, prophetic spirit body of Christ people who will go anywhere the Lamb says to go. They are leading in this hour of history, whether they know it or not. If they're dropping the ball out of the fear of man or spiritual lethargy, if they are dropping the ball and they refuse to lead for any number of reasons, the earth is without leadership in this hour. The leadership of the earth is not mostly in the presidential cabinets across the earth. It's by the intercessors and the prophetic anointing upon God's men and women in governmental positions. Governmental in the spirit. And we can have a host of them right here in this little mission space. It is critical at this time of history, at this hour of history. We are people who, in our own eyes, we are not wise. Last Sunday night, I had called those forward those called to pastoral ministry. And I'm saying some of them will be involved in our congregations. Others of them will bring the pastoral anointing throughout the whole spiritual family. And our spiritual family is bigger than our 20 congregations. One of these days, we are going to have a hundred congregations. And that is not a prophecy or a goal. It's just to me, it's clear. It's not a goal, but I believe it's going to happen. I'm not hoping it does, or hoping it doesn't. I don't really care because those hundred congregations will come, and it will be a larger number than that. And then the hour will come, and the Lord says, Now I want you to merge all of them into this other deal, whatever it's going to be. Who knows what it's going to be? Now just merge in. And all of you, you've been equipped and you've been nurtured under a spirit of prayer, a prophetic Elijah spirit of prophecy. You know the times, you know the seasons. Now go serve those other congregations, disband it, get under them and build it. It really doesn't matter because what we're after is the city church built in power and in fire according to the present tense will of God where the unction of God is in that hour that flows out of intimacy in our lives. Anyway, I was talking and maybe a hundred people came up last week and I said, in this spiritual family, in our missions base, and whether you are on the staff or not, 
You are part of this spiritual family if your heart in the Holy Spirit says yes to it. In the FCF reality, our commitment to be a New Testament church is far bigger than our congregations. You may not be a part of our 20 congregations, but you're still a part of the FCF reality of who we are as a missions base in the Spirit. Our calling to dwell together as a spiritual family is bigger than our congregations, but our congregations are a critical dimension of providing pastoral anointing throughout all of the spiritual family that goes across this missions base and all of those who feel connected to it. I see every single one of our staff members as being part of this spiritual family. Now, here's an idea that is different than some have grown up with. You can be part of this spiritual family and you can be part of the spiritual family down the road in the First Baptist Church and that works well with my heart because I believe it works well with the Holy Spirit. When you're part of this spiritual family, when you've said yes in the grace of God to be part of this, you don't have to say no to the other group to say yes to this group. I absolutely resist the idea that if you come and give your heart to this thing, that somehow you are not to give your heart to the other thing and the other thing. I believe God is building something so new in this city and all of the cities of the earth. He's saying, I want my cheerleaders planted all over the city. You can still be one family. You can be one fellowship together and be vitally linked to other dimensions of the body of Christ in Kansas City. Some of you come to the night meetings. You come to the Encountering God services. You come to one or two of them. From my point of view, you are fully invited to be a part of this reality called FCF whether you never go to a congregation or not. Others of you might go to a congregation and you might go to another congregation down at the First Baptist Church as well. You may go to a congregation here Thursday and then you may go there Sunday. Phenomenal. I love it. You may be involved in other ways. We want to seek the Lord. We don't know where we're going. Really. We know we're going into the heart of God. I don't know what the structure looks like. This is real. I'm saying, Lord, we want to be one of the many groups that pioneer a new thing here in this city. Not us pioneer, many groups pioneer. We want to do our little part of pioneering. We want to find out how can we be bound together as one spiritual family, yet not in any way diminish our connectedness, and even our commitment to other dimensions of the family of God in this city. How can people belong to this, first-class members, if you want to use a traditional term, of first-class members of this FCF reality, far bigger than our congregations, and yet a first-class member of another place as well, without any division or tear in your heart whatsoever? I'm against drawing lines that make people tear relationships in order to celebrate in different parts of the body of Christ in the city. I am absolutely against it. I believe there is one church in Kansas City. I also believe there is one storehouse in Kansas City. One storehouse. I believe in the storehouse in the old days. It was that big old barn that brought all of the resource in in order to feed the people. I believe there is one church in Kansas City, and there is one storehouse. And I believe there is many, many expressions of the one church and many little storehouses all over the city. And here is what I believe the storehouse is. It's the resource committed to build the body of Christ in the city and then reach out to the nation. People have asked me, they say, is this a valid storehouse? I say, here's the answer. It's not a valid storehouse because we have a name on the building that says this or that. We are a storehouse. We are a little storehouse under the big one, the purpose of God. Here's the answer. Inasmuch as we are committed to build the body of Christ in this city, we are a storehouse. The storehouse is not one particular congregation. Many of us have grown up in places which 
Whatever congregation you're a part of, it was your church and your storehouse. I want to challenge that. You are one expression of the church of your city and one little expression of the storehouse of the big storehouse of your city. You can be deeply involved here. Again, I'm going to use a traditional term. I want to come up with different terminology. You can be a you can be deeply involved here. Again, I'm going to use a traditional term. I want to come up with different terminology. You can be a first-class member of this spiritual family and sow your economics here and sow your economics there, spend your time here and spend your time building the body of Christ there, and we absolutely rejoice in that reality. You may be part of one of the 20 congregations that grows to 100 plus, and you may be one of the company we ask to stay a part of FCF as we disband the congregations and send them out to serve other congregations all over the Kansas City area. You are not part of FCF because you go to a congregation. The thing the Lord did on December 5th, I released to these congregations was He was establishing the pastoral anointing in our missions base. We have a prayer anointing. Our International Mission Center is going to be an outreach anointing. It is going to serve the whole family. We have, with Lenny and Tracy, the Children's Equipping Center, it will serve the whole missions base as well as the city. Our prayer ministry is to serve the missions base and the city church. Our mission is to serve our missions base in the city church. Our Children's Equipping Center serves our missions base, our spiritual family in the city church. Shiloh, in the prophetic anointing, serves our missions base, build the city church. Our mandate to Israel, same thing. Our FCF congregations provide a pastoral anointing throughout our whole spiritual family. That in itself is not the sum total of who we are as a people, and yet we want that pastoral anointing to serve other places throughout the city. I'm on a spiritual journey that I really do not fully know, and I feel confident not knowing. We're on a journey together. The Lord has called us to be together. But if you're on the IHOP staff or not, if you have that yes in your spirit, you are part of this thing. If you and the Holy Spirit agree that you are, then you are. It's just that simple. And whether you call it membership or not membership, I don't really care. I just say, we're in, we love each other, we're going for it, and all of the other terminology typically ends up building walls of division. It doesn't have to, but it typically does. And I want to find out terminology where we can be in this thing together all the way without it building walls to building the other parts of the body of Christ in our city. There has to be a way. I don't have it all clear yet, but we're on a journey. 1 Corinthians 3.18, the passage I ended with. If you think you are wise, if you think you know how this thing is going to land and its details become foolish, disavow your own wisdom, come before me, Isaac on the altar, put it down before me, bow before me, cast your crowns before me, lay your dream, Isaac, before me, Lay your crowns, your 20, 30 years of ministry, lay it down. Come and ask me, what am I doing in Kansas City in 2003? Ask it again in 2004. Ask it all through 2005, 2010, 2020, and stay in that posture and you will build a sure foundation that will be silver and precious stones and gold on the last day. People say, well, what is this thing going to look like? I say, I don't know, but I don't feel a burden to know right now. I don't have to know right now. I know this, God is changing the understanding and expression of Christianity across the earth. I know the only foundation is Jesus in our lively living relationship with that man in the present tense. I know the only true foundation, the structures the Holy Spirit is breathing on today. 
not the ones he was breathing on 10 years ago. That he's calling us to lay down. I know those things. There's this traditional mindset that has terminology and people are asking me all the time to sort it out and I could come up with a clever answer, but I want an anointed answer. They go, are we a church? I go, we're a spiritual family. What they mean is, are we a church? I say, we're not what you're thinking about, what you came out of. No, that's not what we are. But I'm not saying that what you came out of is the church. It might be part of the body of Christ, but it's not the church in its ideal form. So I don't want to say that because some people are going to go backwards and say, oh, we're that thing I did for 10 years down the road. That is not what I'm saying. We're a spiritual family. We're committed to New Testament Christianity. We want to walk out New Testament church life with apostolic power. Am I a member? Who came up with that idea anyway? Where's that member word at? Some guy probably in 1402 made it up and all the leaders said, this works good for us, let's use it. I go, do you mean you're vitally connected? Or do you mean you're only connected here and excluded from other places because that's normally what membership means and that word bugs me. I go, because it means, not that the word is wrong, it means if I'm with you, I'm not with them and I'm going to send in my papers and let them know that I'm not with them. And I go, no, don't say that. Is this my storehouse? Is this the place I give my tithes and offerings? I go, well, there's one storehouse in the city under the leadership of the Holy Spirit that's building up the body of Christ. This is one storehouse. There are many of them you can be at using the traditional phrase, fully committed member, and so here, so there, so over there, as long as it's building the body of Christ in our city and reaching out to the nations. I don't want to tell people this is their storehouse. Here's the terms I don't want. We're a church. You are members. This is your storehouse. That conjures up so many wrong ideas, not because the terms are in themselves wrong, but because they're associated in our experience with so many wrong, separatist, isolated, denominational spirit ideas. I go, I don't want to use those ideas. This is your spiritual family. This is your spiritual family. What do I call it? Well, I call it what you want to call it. The pastoral anointing is under the name of FCF. Our mandate from heaven is to be a missions base. Our primary centerpiece function is house of prayer. I go, what do you want to call it? By the pastoral name? By the divine mandate? Friends of the bridegroom? Or do you want to call it by our function? I don't care what you call it. Your church is the church of Kansas City. Well, I want to know, is this my church? The church of Kansas City is your church. But in the church I grew up in, they told me that was my church. Take that thing and shoot it. Well, what was the name of it? If you want to name it by the pastoral anointing, call it FCF. If you want to call it by our mandate, it's our missions base. If you want to call it by our centerpiece function, call it house of prayer. I don't know. We're into the city, what God's doing in Kansas City. Where's my membership? Do you love the people and the purpose here? Yes, you're a member here. Do you love the people that you're hanging out with here? And the people you're going to meet in three years you haven't met yet? Yes, you're members here. I cannot be a member of three places because back in the 80s, they taught me I could only be a member at the one church I was at. Shoot that one too. I mean, really shoot it. I go, who pulled this stuff off? Is this my storehouse? I go, that bugs me. The question bugs me. I go, the church of Kansas City is your storehouse, building the body of Christ. Well, I don't know where to get my tithes and offerings. 
Give your money to that which you believe in the Holy Spirit is building the body of Christ that you feel the blessing of God in giving it. And you may give it in several different places any given month. You may give part of it here, part of it there, but give it to that which is building the city church and reaching out to the nations. Well, I could go on and on. And just as a warning, I am going to go on and on, but in the weeks to come. Let's stand.